Council Transportation Committee for Monday, January 27th. The first order of business tonight is approval of agenda. Did anyone have any changes or additions to the agenda? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. A motion to second. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. And the agenda is approved. Next is approval of the minutes from the January 13th, 2020 meetings. Did anyone have any changes or additions? If not, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. So moved. Have motions or a second? A second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. And the minutes are approved. Next, we're moving on to the tab liaison report. We have Mr. Duguay here. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, honorable members of the committee, General Manager Koistra, Director Thompson, and of course, Jenna, who puts this all together. At least puts it all together for me. So thank you. Uh, the first order, uh, uh, first news for, uh, this is more for you personally, but you may know her, uh, Mary Liz Holberg, who is the commissioner in Dakota County, is now the Dakota County representative to the TAB, replacing that, uh, substituting for Kathleen Gaylord. <coughs> and for con for constituents of yours, uh, the MnDOT reported that the Highway 5 project is still on for the spring, uh, replacing bridges, and that's going to be interesting. They haven't come up with the final plan. Uh, but it's certainly going to affect Mr. Mr. Koyster and his group. And the wetness in the fall delayed uh, several projects, but they hope to make up in the spring. Uh, MPCA phase two of the VW settlement is uh, the money has been allocated or released. That's 50% of it, uh, 23 million, be spent in the 2020 to 2024 time period. It will be primarily directed at helping school districts convert from fuel buses to electric buses, which are Consider be more expensive, and also it will help. Uh, it will also place electric charges along the state's 2,500 mile highway system, approximately every 50 to 70 miles, and uh, a half hour charge will deliver 100 miles. And these are, Director Thompson, hopefully you will correct me, but I believe these are the $150,000 ones, and then there's another one that charges faster, but it's, I believe, it's double the price. Something like that? I believe so, yes. Okay. And then uh, from the MAC, uh, uh, Member Crimmins, who reported that the Air Force, I'm sorry, the Armed Forces Service Center at the airport has been doubled and at the request of the service members moved inside security. Uh, they also won several awards uh, on snow removal. Uh, they have some unique techniques which they're spreading to other airports. And trip, uh, uh, AAA Magazine uh, recommended them as one, as one of the best airports in the in the country, and uh, showed statistics of they g generate uh, 546 million dollars in taxes each year, 87 jobs rely on the 87,000 jobs rely on the airport, and 21,200 people actually work at the airport. And on the new parking garages, there are two solar arrays which uh, already have contributed uh, approximately 11 million uh, hours of energy. And there's no charge for the operations. The business that runs the, um, uh, the solar arrays gets the rebates. And uh, TAB approved several, uh, three items that are on your agenda tonight. The Public Transit and Human Services Transportation Coordinated Plan. And I see Heidi in the audience, the expert. And then the Unified Planning Work Program. Uh, and, and, and Amy is here. Thank goodness Amy is here for the UPWP and explaining the timetable because I consider myself a reasonably smart, well, you know, I was in the back of the class, but I couldn't stand it. I couldn't understand those dates for all the money anyway. <laughs> Hopefully she can explain it. And then the safety performance targets will be brought to you as well. Uh, and the prim primary purpose of uh, Amy's presentation on the UPWP is getting ready for the 2050 uh, Thrive, the regional uh, development guide. Hard to believe we're talking about 2050 already. <clears throat> okay. And also, uh, coming, to, coming to a vote in February at the TAB will be a, a draft plan for uh, a couple of changes in the streamlined TIP amendment process. We'll bring those to you at that time. And then lastly, since you may know uh, Commissioner McGuire of Ramsey County, she was appointed Vice Chair of the County Board. That's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. DeGan? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're on to MTS Director Thompson. Madam Chair, members, just two quick updates tonight. This is the week we uh, provide training to all our local partners on how to apply for the regional solicitation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so we're expecting uh, two different training <clears throat> sessions, uh, typically attended by city, county, uh, providers, suburban providers, and then uh, the consultants that they hire. A lot of changes this year, so expecting good turnout. Uh, Metro Cities hosts one on Friday, and then we host one here this week too. Uh, the other update is uh, late, late in December, we had uh, the vendor for our transit link service that provides service to the airport in Hennepin County uh, decided to opt out of their contract and we've started that switch over. You, you've approved that contract. We switched over the service for those that use the service to the airport in the middle of the night. That occurred last weekend without any hitches and the remaining Hennepin County service switch occurs this weekend. Uh, we don't think it'll have any impact on the customers. For the airport service, if you're not aware of that, um, employers at the MAC, we're trying to get late night uh, service for, for employees that would uh, arrive for a 2 or 4 a.m. shift from the east side of the metro. And there was no transit service at that, that time. So we partnered with them where they would pay half the fare. Uh, the employers would and we would get them to the airport in the middle of the night and then they would take transit home at the end of their shift and so that's been working out really well and this new vendor actually is our metro mobility provider who provides service 24 7 in minneapolis and st paul and so i think we're going to actually have more drivers available to provide that service at two in the morning or four in the morning so it should be a good benefit to the employers and employees Going to the MAC in the middle of the night, they should have some more options. We'll be able to meet that demand. And that allows businesses to open a little bit earlier and provide some key uh, for really good jobs at the airport that uh, they were having a hard time attracting employees and we're providing that service in partnership with the MAC. So with that, Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Any questions for Director Thompson? All right, General Manager Forster. Sure, I have a couple as well. The leg uh, mentioned that the uh, Legislative Commission on Metropolitan Go Government is scheduled to meet on February 5. Uh, right now, the official agenda is posted as to be, ter de to be determined, but uh, based on what we have heard, uh, they're going to have an interest in talking about uh, transit security, possibly the operator shortage and some of the other issues that, that we know that, that are challenging us at this, at this time. Um, and we'll also mention in that, in that light that the legislative session kicks off on February 11th. Uh, also, we are eyeing February 14th as the Mall of America Transit Center grand opening event. You will be receiving more information on that, but I just want to kind of get that on your radar uh, as, we near that, as we near that date. That was a $25 million project, and it's changed how we enter uh, Mall of America with our buses and our trains and the facilities have been changed significantly in that area and uh, I, it, it'll be a nice nice event and, and a date we've been looking forward to. Also wanted to mention that we had a meeting with New Flyer uh, 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 CEO and staff on last Thursday regarding uh, progress on the electric bus. Uh, the new Flyer CEO came in from Winnipeg to meet with us. Uh, we had, I think, a good conversation. We currently, as an update, have the BCTC chargers uh, running right now and they're in revenue service and we're, of course, just seeing uh, the consistency of their use. But some of the results we've gotten back have been promising to us. We've been seeing, uh, the certainly seeing the benefit of charging online and uh, feeling uh, right now the initial results are hopeful to us. We've learned to be cautious in our optimism with this project because it's been two steps forward, one step back, but uh, we feel really good about what we're seeing as far as the benefit of the online charger. I'll mention we received those chargers almost exactly a year ago, so it took a year to get them into revenue service. Uh, that was the basis of our conversations with New Flyer. Uh, we talked about uh, that the we, we had a conversation about uh, our intent was to purchase electric buses that were working. We ended up with very much a research and development project. And, uh, and so uh, they have agreed to work with us in restructuring the contract to reflect the experiences that we've had with it. That includes looking at changes in warranty, availability of service from them, uh, ongoing service, parts, availability, and so forth. So uh, it was, I thought, a very good meeting. Uh, they were very apologetic for how things have gone thus far. And I think it was, uh, I feel optimistic that they were willing to work with us in, in, again in restructuring a contract to more reflect what that relationship has been like. So that's all I have. 
Thank you. Any questions for General Manager Coyster? Uh, uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. How many buses do we have currently in service left? We have uh, eight uh, on, a, on any given day. I can't tell you how many we have in services today, but we've been we've been running about six of them fairly regularly, but without the on, without the online charger at BCTC. And so uh, I think the last the data I received was that uh, we have already structured. We've had to restructure our routes to based upon not having an online charger, so based upon a lower distance than we wanted to get out of them. But I will say we've done some testing the other day, and it showed that uh, uh, with the online chargers, uh, we had we had gotten 84 we had, we had gotten to 84 miles uh, with with this was revenue service with 67 percent charge left. So that's that's good news. And so we're seeing that sawtooth sort of charge go down, go back up, go back down, look to it. And, and so that's ex that really reflects what we were expecting coming into the project. Now, this is a year later. So I want to keep reminding you of that. And, and, and I think that's, that's our message to New Flyer. It's our message to Siemens, who's New Flyer subcontractor on the, on the charging portion. But um, again, I thought the conversation was really a very good conversation on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Atlas and Gibson. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Wes, are those all on the C line, or are they different lines, or where are those buses being utilized? Those those buses are on C line. Okay. Only. All right. Any additional questions? All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, pardon me, Excuse Mr. Dayan. Madam Chair, uh, what, uh, Wes, what date was that a grand opening for the mall? Uh, February fourteenth. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Valentine's Day. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank you very much. So we're on to our first order of business is uh, the con uh, consent agenda. There are four items on consent. Um, we entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. And consent items are passed. Next, we move on to our non consent items. The first item is item 2020 32, <clears throat> with the Southwest LRT amendment number one to master utility agreement with CenturyLink. We've got Jim Alexander. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members. Uh, Jim Alexander, Project Director for Southwest LRT. So this item uh, 2020 32 relates to uh, relocation utilities. Uh, we're looking to uh, uh, amend a master utility agreement that we have with uh, with CenturyLink to uh, to uh, um, relocate uh, a number of uh, uh, communication utilities in the uh, in the eastern part of the project near uh, near the near the Bassett Creek Valley. <coughs> um, some background on this: uh, we uh, we we originally had uh, had gone to the civil contractor to do this work, and uh, just uh, do logistics, uh, timing, and just uh, cost. We're looking for a change order to do this. It wasn't in their original contract, and uh, we found that uh, it would be a better better for us in the project if we went with a, a utility that owned the part of it because it's, it's, it's made up of a bunch of different utility companies that have to move these communication lines, and it's been better to uh, have a have a utility company move this in terms of costs. And so we had been pursuing with uh, Sprint to do this work. Uh, there's a business item 2019-305 that uh, brought before you uh, last quarter. And uh, we were in negotiation with Sprint and uh, it's been uh, complicated with a merger that they are going through right now with uh, T-Mobile. And so because of that merger, there's been some been some questions about their how they're handling their financing and all that and so we uh, have been kind of going on a different route to look at uh, at CenturyLink to do this work instead and so we're pursuing that path and so that's the item I have before you to uh, see if you're uh, willing to approve this to move this forward yeah Madam Chair that's my uh, background on this council members have any questions for the presenter all right, if not, I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-32. So moved. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Jim. All right, thank you. All right, next we're on to business item 2020-34, master contracts for rail engineering services. We have Julie Brenny. Welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair and committee members, I'm Julie Brenny with Engineering and Facilities at Metro Transit, and I'm presenting business item 2020-34, Master Contracts for Rail Engineering Services, contract 19P131. 
Metro Transit has used master contracts for nearly um, 20 years. This procurement is for a group of contracts to replace four that expired on 1231 of 19. The contracts will be used by staff for a range of projects at light rail and commuter rail facilities and both public and support facilities. The funding for the work is provided in the various projects and those projects would be brought forward for approval through the capital budget or operating budgets and work orders would be issued after um, the funding is approved. So it is a work order basis. Um, there's no guarantee to the vendors that they receive any um, specific work. And for this procurement, we worked with the Office of Equal Opportunity and we have a 10% DBE goal that's been applied to the contracts. Um, we have another series of contracts where we have a DBE goal and we've been working closely with the Office of Equal Opportunity to ensure that we are meeting those goals or exceeding those goals. So we've developed a relationship, so I'm confident that we can do the same with this group of contracts. And so we are requesting authorization to award four contracts of varying dollar amounts for a total of 2.5 million, and the contracts would have a term of approximately five years. And with that, if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Questions for the presenter, uh, Councilmember Atlas and Gretzen. Thank you, Chair. I'm just curious, when the contracts were in place from, you said 2019 is the last time, were there DBE goals then, or were they able to accomplish their DBE goals at that time? Um, Madam Chair and committee members, there was not a DBE goal on that group of contracts. So this is new for the vendors. Um, but we have, we do a lot of outreach with the vendors. Um, we work pretty closely with them to ensure that they'll meet these goals. And we do have one person in OEO that's tracking these um, on a regular basis and contacts the vendors if they're not meeting their goal. And I'm copied on all of that correspondence and we're working pretty close together on that. And then we're also working with our staff so that our staff is asking the vendor, you know, can you use a sub on this? Can you, can you, you know, complete part of your goal with this project? So it's, it's a multifaceted process to meet those goals. Thank you, uh, General Manager Koistra. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just wanted to mention to your question, uh, Council Member, that uh, I'm going back in my history. I was regional administrator. I was always concerned about master contracts because it seemed to cut out disadvantaged businesses. <coughs> so I felt I'm really happy that they're finding a way to get DBE goals in this. Maybe maybe we can do better in the future. There's always a way to do better in the future. But it's, this has been a concern that I've had for some time that, that when we do things under master contract, we lose opportunities for more creative contracting with, with the disadvantaged business. So this is a change. And I appreciate the work of procurement and appreciate the leadership of the engineering facilities group to, to, uh, to make this happen. And I will just make a comment that um, over the, the last two years of the Dayton Council was an expansion of DBE goals more focused on construction to including professional and technical services. And this is a reflection of some of those activities. So, um, additional, um, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you explain a little bit more in depth what the Brooks Act procurement is? Um, sure. The Jody Jacoby could probably explain more clearly. She might want to take that question. Hi, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Jody Jacoby. I'm the director of the procurement department. And a Brooks Act procurement is a federally funded procurement that is a two step. So essentially, uh, prices and costs are sealed, and it's for uh, qualified staff that are architects or engineering. And so the first step of the evaluation is the technical ranking. And the evaluation panel and the committee will technically rank in order of importance. And then once they have that technical rating, then they'll open up the cost proposals and negotiate. So it's strictly based on negotiation with the most technically ranked proposal. Yeah. And it's for uh, certifi certified uh, trades like architects and engineers. Thank you. Councilmember Chambliss. 
Um, thanks. I just wanted to know, Ms. Brinney, um, about the communication of the DBE goals and how do we as an organization, the Metropolitan Council and the contractor communicate about job opportunities and or uh, training opportunities to get a job like this? Madam Chair and committee members, um, we hold an annual um, meet and greet with the large engineering firms and then invite all of the approved small DBE and MCUP firms generally to those meet and greets and we foster uh, interaction between the firms to build those relationships so they can build the, the relationships within them. Um, the positions within those firms are generally technical positions so we do not get involved um, in any of the encouraging people to work for a firm, if that's your question. Um, I've gotten to know a lot of the firms that are DBEs in the engineering marketplace here, and new ones do come in to see us to kind of promote their company, and we try to connect them then with the large firms. So we're trying to bring new firms in when they come into the marketplace as well. Sure, I mean, yes, um, I think sometimes just even if it is a technical position and people do not currently qualify for those types of positions, just knowing that the organization it has a DBE goal and these technical positions are, are something that our communities uh, can have as an opportunity or to aspire to mm -hmm. for careers, I think that is helpful too. Um, and of course, with some of the subcontracts, I would suppose some of those jobs may be not as technical. Is that true or no? Generally, they would still be. They would still be pretty technical. Okay. Of that nature. Um, Madam Chair, committee members, we also, as a department, have a fairly robust um, intern program where we have interns in house, and we actually have had some of our interns who have qualified and gone on to work at a DBE. Um, so we are trying to bring them into the fold as well and then see them go out into the local marketplace to get jobs too. There, thank you. Yep. And I'll just add, Madam Chair, committee members, that additionally with the outreach that we have every year, we also have specific targeted outreach for every procurement where there's a goal and where there's not a goal. And we get that information from the Office of Equal Opportunity, and we directly target those firms that we believe may be interested in either bidding or proposing on it, and invite them to come to the pre-bid meeting or the pre-proposal meeting so they can work hand-in-hand -hand with procurement staff, with the Office of Equal Opportunity, and then learn more from the project manager. Because for co contracts such as this, it's for as-needed work, not a specific prescribed scope. So it's about evolving and better understanding. So if they are added to the list as a qualified MCUB or DBE, that they know about the work and they can um, get a subcontracting opportunity. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions? All right, then I would entertain a motion to approve business item 20-34. So moved. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay. Business item, item carries. Thank you. Uh, next, we're on to <clears throat> business items 2020-35 uh, and 2020-36. We have Chris Beckwith here. Uh, they are both blue line projects. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. So I'm here to present the two business items, starting with 2020-35, which is related to the gold line Bus Rapid Transit Project Engineering Services Consultant. This is the phase two limited notice to proceed. And the reason I'm able to bring this before you today is the project achieved a pretty significant milestone in the last week in getting the Federal Transit Administration, um, they just issued their finding of no significant impact, which we call the FONSI, but really that's the environmental decision that concludes the environmental assessment process. So it's the biggest milestone for us yet on the gold line. 
and it allows us to bring this uh, limited notice to proceed forward to today. So we actually went through the standard process for the environmental services contract, which is with Kimley Horn and Associates, a little bit north of $35 million in total, spanning about seven years. We did issue the phase one notice to proceed shortly after executing the contract in just about a year ago, January 26th of 2018. The reason we're back here for this phase two limited notice to proceed is we wanted to put some additional controls in the contract so we didn't let that design process get too far ahead of this environmental process. You need to clear the environmental assessment and get all of the clearances in place before you pursue design too far. So we put that into our contract to make sure we could come back to the committee and have you uh, approve that next limited notice to proceed. So this, um, there was a DBE goal on the original contract of 20% which resulted in a 22% commitment once we got the proposals and reviewed those and negotiated that contract. So that goal, that commitment of 22% applies to the limited notice to proceed, regardless of the work we add to it, regardless of the phase we're in, that will carry through all the way to the end. The proposed action then before you is that the Met Council authorize a notice to proceed for phase two for professional services with the, the contract with Kimley Horn and Associates for the Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Project in the amount not to exceed $8.1 million. Thank you. Any questions from council members? Council member Gonzalez. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just as, this is more for my information about how the technical aspects work, but I was just looking at the, the total amount for consulting services was over $35 million. Is that the ballpark range for consulting services in this type of project? Because it sounds like a lot of money just for consulting, right? Madam Chair, um, Council Member, um, $35 million is a significant amount of money. It does cover, cover seven years. So it covers us in the project development phase, the engineering phase, and it covers us all the way through construction. So when we have design changes during construction, the same team is there to respond to those design changes. So it's a seven year contract. General Manager, General Manager Koistra, you had a comment? Madam Chair, I was going to uh, suggest that Chris say what consulting services is because consulting can, can be misleading in terms of the actual services that they provide. Um, yes, Madam Chair, this is engineering services. Mm -hmm. So it's strictly the engineering of the project, the roadway design, um, the facilities design, stations, uh, drainage, and traffic control devices. So it's all the engineering that goes into that. Yep. Any additional questions? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-35. Motion to approve. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> motion carries. Again? So the next business item is 2020-36, and this is for a master funding agreement that we have with MnDOT. It's a subordinate funding agreement number four that falls under the master funding agreement probably seen a few of these come through for other projects. This is our fourth for the gold line. The um, previous three subordinate funding agreements with MnDOT were for staffing, so it's where the project paid MnDOT for the staffing. This subordinate funding agreement is where MnDOT is actually paying project for work. So the work that they are paying us for is we are reconstructing the Maple Pedestrian Bridge as part of the project, and that is eligible for a federal match. <coughs> MnDOT has asked us to upgrade the design of that bridge, so we're removing a center pier, and it'll be a, a single span crossing 94. And the reason for that is so that if they do any expansion or any work underneath the bridge in the future, they won't impact the bridge. So they are paying for the delta cost to upgrade to that single span. The 22% um, goal that I just mentioned in the last business item is it's the same contractor that will be doing this work. So that same DBE goal applies to this work, regardless of if MnDOT's paying it or we're paying it, um, it still applies because it's in our contract. So 22% DBE participation commitment for design. And then in the future, when we do the construction for this work, the DBE goal, whenever it's assigned then, will also apply to this work in the future. So the proposed action is that the Met Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute the Metro Gold Line subordinate funding agreement number four related to the Maple Pedestrian Bridge with MnDOT for an amount not to exceed 640000 Thank you. Any questions for, from council members? Uh, council member Cummings. Thank you. I'm just curious how often it happens that we do the work and get reimbursed by MnDOT. Is that common? Uh, Madam Chair, committee member, that is, it's not 
overly common. I think we've got probably less than a half a dozen of these underway right now. This is the first one we're bringing before the transportation committee, but there's a couple other ones from cities that are also coming along. They're not very common though. Okay, thank you. All right, any additional questions? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to approve <clears throat> business item 2020-36. So moved. Moved, second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, motion carries, thank you. All right, next we are on to business item 2020-41. It's the Public Transit and Human Services Transportation Coordinated Plan. We have Heidi Schalberg. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members. Um, the Public Transit and Human Services Transportation Coordinated Plan is a federally required plan for improving both public and private transportation services across the region that focus primarily on older adults and people with disabilities. The plan is also designed to encourage coordination among these different types of services. The plan's primary use is to guide federal funding investments in projects that improve mobility for these two population groups. So Section um, 5310 funding through the Federal Transit Administration is administered through MnDOT through a competitive process in the region. And so applicants for that funding need to address strategies included in this plan. So we held a public comment period on the draft plan from November 12th through December 27th. And we received 26 comments from 10 different individuals and organizations. Those are listed in the comment summary memo included in the agenda item. So about 12 of the comments resulted in overall relatively minor changes <coughs> to the plan. And rather than being shown in the red line version of the plan, which I don't think was posted on that, they're identified, the comments that resulted in changes are identified in that memo with the page numbers is it, where the changes were made. So just a very brief overview of, of what we heard from the comments um, that resulted in changes. We added data, um, including forecasted older adult population in our demographics chapter in light of the um, sharp increase that we expect for this population group in the region in response to some of the comments that we received. Some of the comments also highlighted um, specific challenges in parts of the region with uh, employment and healthy food access as different types of destinations. So the plan is designed to include specific strategies, but also needs to retain flexibility for the different partners that do this work across the region. So we did add language in the needs chapter just to kind of flesh that out a little bit more and provide some additional detail on the types of destinations that um, may be challenges in different parts of the region. But we've also heard of other destination types throughout the process as well. One of the strategies that was included was both edited and we did elevate it to a higher priority strategy based on comments that we received um, for providing local shutter, shuttle or circulator type service in communities um, that was previously categorized as a medium strategy and we moved that to a high strategy based on some of the comments and added um, some potential examples that it could be used for employment or it could also take form of microtransit. And then there were other relatively minor text changes again the um, comment memo that you received highlights where those changes were made. Some of the other comments that we heard from more than one um, individual organization, <coughs> excuse me, that may not necessarily result in changes in the plan. Um, we heard that there's interest, especially in Washington County, as far as elevating vanpooling as a viable option rather than viewing it as competitive with transit. Um, so there were not changes made for this plan specifically. Um, but our staff are involved in reevaluating that program this year. Um, and so I've seen the, the staff involved in that reevaluation have reviewed these comments. We've also heard a couple of comments as far as providing more Uber or Lyft style ride hailing options for people. Um, again, this is some work that's already being done in the region, both with the council through the RFP for Metro Mobility Service to pilot this, and both Washington and Dakota counties are currently running pilots. And then some of the specific recommendations from the Metro Mobility Task Force that was done to the legislature. Um, some of the comments highlighted specific recommendations from those. Some of those recommendations are things that have either been addressed through the legislature, such as sharing information with DHS, um, or in process, such as the RFP for ride hailing style services. Um, so those did not necessarily result in changes to the plan. I would also just note that we typically try to use what we hear in processes as input for our other public planning processes. So for example, these comments have been shared with Metro Transit for their network next work as well. Um, that's all I have as far as a brief overview. I'd be happy to 
answer any questions you may have. Otherwise, we are looking for an action to recommend approval. Thank you very much. Any questions for the presenter? All right. If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-41. So moved. Motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other <clears throat> discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we are on to business item 2020-42. It's the UPWP amendment. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and, and committee members. I'm David Burns uh, with MTS uh, Highway Planner. Um, and I have two items uh, that I'm about to present to you. The first is 2020-42, which is a unified planning work program amendment. Uh, the Unified Planning Work Program is a federally required document that outlines our transportation planning activities for a particular year. Um, it was uh, approved by the full council on September 25th of last year, and we are requesting an amendment for three uh, major reasons. Uh, the first is, uh, as we've discussed, and my understanding is has been outlined by Amy Venowitz, um, we are... <coughs> Uh, we are going to be updating our 2040 transportation policy plan. Um, now, if you follow, wish to follow along, um, that is, you can see some of the adjusted uh, tasks on page 18 of the amended UPWP document. Um, so this is a major work activity and uh, significantly alters kind of uh, our scope for the year. So that uh, was one of the major reasons for uh, requesting the UPWP amendment. Uh, the second uh, is an adjustment to the scopes and budgets of some of the consultant-led projects. Uh, basically, the UPWP is developed in June of the previous year, and as we start to develop these scopes and talk to consultants, uh, they, they change a little bit, and uh, we provide a little bit more detail. Um, I'll provide a little more detail on the changes on the next slide. And uh, third is just a change in the overall budget to reflect uh, additional federal funds that were previously not available. Um, that total federal funds, uh, we received an additional $666,667 in uh, consolidated planning grant funds. And that actually uh, reduces our the council's local match from 34% to 27%. And you can see the updated budget on page 30 of the documents. Okay, um, in terms of some of the specific consultant study changes, we added the following studies, the regional solicitation before and after study, phase number two, the mobility hub planning guide, uh, the regional electric vehicle planning study, uh, the TSPE, uh, Peer review on page 37, you can see that. And we removed the following studies, the roadway right sizing project. We didn't receive real good feedback from our partners on that one, so we decided to allocate our resources on other studies. And the general peer regional research um, and comparison study. And all of those are outlined on the pages shown in the PowerPoint. And with that, um, we are asking for uh, approval to uh, amend the 2020 UPWP and submit to MnDOT. And I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions from council members? Uh, council member Atlas Ingerbertson. Hi, could you share why there, when, so on page 14, and I, I think I noticed this in another place too, one of the changes was removal of like a consultant from developing something to just say develop. Um, it, does that mean consultants will not be utilized for that? In this case, it was related to um, guidelines for bike, ped, um, bicycle um, facilities. So, or yeah. And so, I'm just curious why that part is that significant in some way? Is it to leave openness? It's the second bullet on the under activities on page 14 that removal of using consultants to lead that study, or is it just making it more vague? Uh, 
Um, Madam Chair, that's actually a, a great question. Thank you very much. That is strictly a word change. That consultant study is still uh, in the UPWP. Um, it's just a little bit more specific and, well, a little more general, but a little bit more specific on the tasks that uh, we're ultimately uh, looking to have completed. And I, I thanks, Chair. Um, I, I don't know that it's, I always like explicit language because then it doesn't leave room for speculation or, or things out. I think it's fine to do that. I think um, if the spirit is that there's sometimes also value that we come from listening from folks to folks outside of the organization and, 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 and that, especially when it comes to kind of specialty areas of, of study or opportunities to engage some of our advocacy groups in understanding that. So if that's still the intent and what's happening, um, it's, that would be helpful to keep. Additional questions? Councilmember Gonzalez. Uh, thank you. I just have a question about why the general peer regional research was eliminated. Um, I kind of saw that perhaps the TSPE took its place. Is, is that the case? Or, or can you just explain more about that? Yes, <clears throat> Madam Chair and uh, uh, Council members. Uh, this actually, uh, this was just like a, almost a placeholder study. And what ultimately became of it is we uh, rolled that in to the electrical vehicle, electric vehicle study, which is uh, right before it, the Twin Cities Region Electric Vehicle Planning Study. Um, this was just, like I said, a, a placeholder study for uh, research that we'd like to do around uh, the benefiting the region, and we decided that we would consolidate our resources into the electric vehicle study. All right, thank you. Councilmember Chambliss. Thank you, you're quick. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question uh, also related to the um, highway corridor studies, mm -hmm. and I'm glad to see that uh, Hennepin County's Highway 252 study is in there for improving mobility and safety because I know that's a hot topic right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we get that information and people are able to research it, uh, I'll be happy to point them to that study. Great, thank you. All right, additional questions from council members? All right, if not, I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2020-43. Move to approve. Motion, is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Oh, sorry, 2020-42, I moved ahead on you. So um, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed aye. nay. And the motion carries. Yep, business and item 2020-43 now. So. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Another federal requirement, uh, federal law requires each MPO to annually adopt safety performance targets for the planning <laughs> area. Um, in the past, we actually used MnDOT's target setting methodology and applied it to the metro area, metro area totals. Uh, doing so this year proved problematic and would result in an increased targets, uh, a target for fatalities and fatality rates. And ultimately, this is not a message we want to convey. Um, instead, <coughs> we are proposing the 2020 target for the 2020 targets that they reflect a 1.5% reduction in fatalities and fatality rate and a 5% reduction in serious injuries from our previously adopted 2019 targets. So we would not be using actual to totals from 2018 as MnDOT did in this process. We would be decreasing from the 2019 targets, continuing to reflect that we want to improve safety within the region. Um, and the uh, business item has the, uh, has, the, has the totals here, the total traffic fatalities of 106 uh, fatality rate per 100 mil million vehicle miles traveled of 0 0.34, uh, serious injury crashes of 738, uh, crash rate of 2.36, and non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries of 181. And uh, 
we, we obviously want to aim to be lower than this, um, but this is a, a reduction from the 2018 actuals. Thank you. Any questions from council members? Uh, Council Member Gonzalez. Just a, a question about those numbers, about the total traffic fatalities. Are those statewide? Uh, just, um, Madam Chair, uh, just the uh, metro area, the statewide was uh, somewhere in the three to 400 range. So the total traffic fatalities does not include, is not just limited to metro transit incidents. It's, it, it, Excuse me. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, it's all, it's all on all roads within the metro area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Councilmember Atlas and your Britson. Thanks for listening to my gasp for air. Um, I I don't think we've seen um, crash statistics for um, for our services, but that might be an interesting thing to see at some point. Um, yeah, so a little bit of a, a breakout of, of those. I know this is broader than us, but that is something that I think, especially as people have raising concerns around safety across our different modes, that might be an interesting Good information idea. item to have sometime. Director Thompson. Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, another federal requirement this summer is we do have to produce a transportation safety plan. And part of that, the MPO needs to put um, safety numbers for transit within that. And I think that'd be a good time that we could bring forward information item that breaks out the services of the council and metro transit uh, is part of that so i think that is due in uh i'm looking at my july uh so it'd be sometime this this summer we would bring that forward i think it'd be great to see if we can and i know sometimes we don't have the best information because when there are crashes we don't always get usually information data comes from police reports and, and things that are always available or or completed fully but it'd be great to have at least some um, geographic um, information it's nice to know where there's hot spots um, especially when it comes to increasing safety for pedestrians um, and as, as well so it might I, if there's some overlap if we do find hot spots with data from the local communities um, to see if there's an overlap between their most dangerous intersections or areas and where we're seeing issues that might be interesting to see as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sure we can come up with something. It's a good idea. Um, all right. Any other questions? All right. Now it, I'd entertain a motion to approve item 2020-43. So moved. Motion second. second. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that is our last business item. I would propose that all of the items on consent move to the consent on, to council and everything but business item number three, which is business item 2020-35 move on consent. Is everyone okay agree with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Now we are on to information for this evening. First, we have a uh, real maintenance overview. We have Dan Suggs here. And this is related to the, our the uh, rail uh, rail systems post green light service um, adjustment. Welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Council Members. My name is Daniel Suggs. I'm the Director of Rail Systems. I'd like to give an update on uh, Green Line shutdown as well as some of the things that we're doing for snow removal. Uh, you might wonder what Rail Systems is. Actually, uh, like four departments that's track, traction power, signals, and communications. The traction power department uh, maintains 24 substations that convert 13.8 uh, thousand volts from XL down to 750 volts of DC that powers the trains through the overhead wire. The signal department maintains the signals both for the trains and the bar signals that you'll see <coughs> up and down the line that interface with the, the city controllers, as well as the switches that can move trains from one track to the other and the crossings that protect vehicles and uh, train traffic as well as pedestrians. Our communications department, they handle the reader boards, emergency telephones, uh, uh, the platform cameras, and intrusion systems. Uh, 
prior to the having the shutdowns, we were closed <laughs> with uh, three hazards that we work with every day under uh, conditions <laughs> that are not favorable. Those hazards are, are working under the 750 volt power, live power. We have to deal with vehicle traffic and train traffic. And we have the potential when we're doing that work to interfere with the in-service trains. Our, um, since we've had the shutdowns, we've been able to be more efficient in our work with uh, my <coughs> track department, um, doing drain cleaning, interlocking cleaning. Uh, we've been able to do the Washington Avenue Bridge more, more current or more frequently. That does require a shutdown. We cannot have trains running because of the size of the, the vehicle that has to go through the tunnel or the bridge in order to do that cleaning. Um, and we've also been able to do snow removal. Signal department, much the same thing. Uh, being able to do our switch inspections, interlocking cleanups, uh, wheel counter boxes and pedestrian. Uh, you see that bottom photo there? That's uh, the pedestrian crossings on all of the um, stations and they have to be maintained on a monthly basis. The traction power department um, <coughs> has been able to uh, do inspections without power on the line and um, been able to actually make repairs when they're doing the inspections before we'd have to do them when they're doing out of service so they weren't timely repairs that were made. We just had one where we uh, replaced a sectional insulator during a shutdown that would have caused delays to train if it was found during regular service. And they've been able to maintain and clean all the rail access boxes. And we've had, uh, with snow removal, we do a, uh, a lot of <coughs> pedestrian crossings, but we also do what we call embedded track. And those are uh, where the rail and the surface of the road are on the same. You'll see that like downtown Minneapolis, along Minnehaha, um, let's see, Capitol Hill, Minnehaha, 34th Avenue, West Bank, and uh, uh, Walnut Street as well as the University of Minnesota. Benefits uh, that we receive from this, uh, normally before we had uh, competing interests when we go out to remove snow. We have facilities that uh, would clean the plat platforms, but they'd push snow into the right of way. And then we'd have to deal with uh, the city entities pushing the snow from the uh, street onto the track. Now, during the shutdowns, most of that work has been done already, so our guys could come in and clean all the pedestrian crossings and any buildup that would get on the track. And during heavy snowfalls, we actually use even uh, front-end loaders and uh, dump trucks that scoop up large berms of snow, put them in the trucks, and remove them off to places that are, are accessible out, out of the snow <coughs> right away. And with that, I'll take any questions. Councilmember Chambliss. Um, thank you, Mr. Suggs. I have a question about the, t the time spent during the shutdowns in terms of the, the work time. Mm -hmm. And how has that changed in total time? Has there been a ch has anyone calculated that? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, Councilmember. Um, we've been <coughs> able to actually we, we focus that time because before when we had to do work in the right of way, we'd have to set up uh, what they call work zones. We'd have to put up flags and they'd have to do feedbacks to the control center. That took up to a half an hour and 45 minutes just to get it set up. And they have to do that again when they take it down. Mm -hmm. Right now, we can just put up a board on each end of the work. We can shut off the power and begin our work. So we, we do maximize that time for uh, the maintainers that are out on the field. Okay, so if I may, would you say that the time to perform work is more is less now? I wouldn't say that we have we always have more, more work than we have have time. We've just been able to be more efficient with the time that we have. So you're you're able to get more work done now. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions. 
Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just more a comment. Um, it seems that the safety and welfare of our workforce is, of course, of critical importance. And that Amen. this change for them to be able to be out in a much safer environment to work is challenging just by virtue of it being winter and then all the other things that come along with it. So um, I think this is, is a, a great thing and a, a great way to, to respect the workforce that we have. Thank you. Okay, additional questions? Councilmember Atlas and Britson. This isn't a question, but just a, a, an appreciation. I know this time last year, what was it? It was the bomb cyclone was about to hit us and everything. And so knock on wood, that doesn't occur this year. But I just remember um, getting information items last year about the extreme work that your team went through and, and had to deal with some of the challenges. So just an appreciation for the hard work. And often my dad worked, I don't know if you guys know this, he worked in traffic for the city of Minneapolis for a long time. And he was the only person who painted streets for most of that time. Sometimes there are these jobs that nobody sees happening, but are essential to people getting where they need to go safely every day. And so I just wanna share that appreciation um, for you. And if you can share that with your team, that would be great. Any other? Uh, I'm just gonna echo everything they said. This was a lot of discussion when we made this decision last year and we knew this was gonna be beneficial. And we really wanted to hear back how how it was helping um, your, the people, your department, the people working for you. So thank you for coming and kind of giving us the update. We really appreciate it. And uh, definitely we, uh, on these snowy cold days, um, we think of you all often and appreciate you very much. Thank you, thank Madam you. Chair. Thank you. All right, next we are on to our final information item. We have blending outreach, <clears throat> training, and engineering for accident avoidance. We have John Humphrey and Mike Conlon. Welcome, gentlemen. Madam Chair, Council Members, good afternoon. My name is Michael Conlon. I serve as Director of Rail and Bus Safety. The gentleman to my right is John Humphrey. He serves as Deputy Chief Operating Officer for Rail. And I think I got that right. You did, Mike. For the Thank first you. time ever. We're here today to give an overview of some of the things we've done in recent years at avoiding unintentional injury and damage. We believe that a blend of outreach Training and engineering serve us much better than any one by itself. We're transit. That's what we do. We move people. <coughs> Moving people is what we do. Safety is the cornerstone of what we do. And it is a shared responsibility. It's shared internally among the colleagues in the different departments. And also it's shared with the public. Our efforts are ineffective without public cooperation. We strive for the balance between safety and operational efficiency. We need to consider both of these aspects when we risk failing in our mission of moving people. Transit has been um, recognized in recent years, since 2009, actually six safety awards from the American Public Transportation Association. Um, most recently, the 2017 APTA Gold Award, which embraces some of the things that we're going to talk about today, the blend of engineering and outreach. And also, we're adding in training today. Here are some aspects of our light rail service. The second bullet is kind of interesting. We have so many special events that they now become regular operations for us. John could probably speak to that in much better detail. I'd like to draw your attention to the second last bullet, 167 grade crossings for LRT, for our, for our transit line. <coughs> we extrapolate that out to how many train moves that would be in a year. We would have over 14 million LRT train moves through our grade through grade crossings in a year. Since the commencement of passenger operations in 2004, it exceeds 130 million, all in an urban environment. Here are some aspects of our Metro Transit commuter rail service. The 33 grade crossings there translate into 
122,000 annual grade crossing moves by North Star. And since uh, com commencement of passenger operations, that would be 1,221,000, something like that. And I know that they don't rate rail operators as big or small, only on grade crossings alone. But if they did, Metro Transit would be up along the great, the, the class one railroads like Burlington Northern, Santa Fe, and Canadian Pacific and Union Pacific. So some of our outreach, these, uh, the pictures that you see here are mostly from our most recent surge. I like to call it a surge because we, we always, we don't have a zero level of community outreach and then bump it up during rail safety month. There is some level to begin with, and then there's a surge during rail safety month, which is proclaimed by the governor for the state of Minnesota. We have a great um, relationship with Operation Lifesaver. Operation Lifesaver's mission is to stand as the trusted resource for public education on safe behavior around trains and tracks. They are good at what they do. I've had the pleasure of serving on the board of Operation Lifesaver since 2015, and we have a great relationship. Uh, they help us with um, maintaining that the, the, the middle level, not the zero, the greater than zero level of outreach. And uh, you see on the lower left, you, the, the billboards are, there's all of uh, some grants uh, through Operation Lifesaver that we've had in place in 2019 and in prior years. Lower left are the two mascots. The one with the T is Skip Traffic. Now that's a glamorous name. And I can't get them to change the name, the nickname for the other, which is ST3 for C Tracks Think Trains. They won't change it. So we'll just remain glamorous at transit, but I love them both. And when you see the people come down on transit Thursday, down the escalator, and they're thinking about picking up the kids and I got to do this and I'm going to the gym and I'm going to, I got to get dinner and stop at the store. And they're just coming down the escalator. And then they see these two dancing around down there. Then big smiles, many selfies. And we, we uh, give them um, swag bags, right? Stuff we all get kind of bags. <coughs> Some of the things... They might have something like this, the handy dandy safety is our shared responsibility scraper. You don't have to use your, your credit card anymore. And it's got a little squeegee. And, and they might get something like this, this brochure, safety is a shared responsibility. It has tips about staying safe. And then there's also for the, maybe the younger, I, I won't, categorized, but some folks are more digitally inclined. And the middle bottom is uh, geofencing. We're using GPS. If you come through a geofenced location, which has that virtual <clears throat> geographic boundary, it drops a cookie on your phone. And then if you open up an app like Weather or CNN, you might get something like a, uh, the, the uh, safety banners that you see on those phones. And then, are, then of course, MTPD, they've been very helpful. 30 details most recently <coughs> during Rail Safety Month, uh, split between North Star and, um, and LRT, and they have made over 600 contacts. A few more examples of our, of our outreach. This occurs on platforms, kiosks, interior cards on the trains and buses, the website, social media, you see a wrapped train in the middle there, the C-Tracks Think Train Operation Lifesaver. That was initially implemented in 2016, refreshed for the Super Bowl, and then uh, we refreshed it yet again in 2019. And the brochures you see there depicted are the same as this. They have the same information, but they're expressed in, um, they're published in Hmong, Spanish, and Somali. So in addition to English. One final thought that I have, 
I cannot call up, quantify for you how many tragedies we've avoided with this outreach. But I have a strongly held opinion that it is valuable, these campaigns. We do not have all the answers here at Metro Transit about keeping everyone safe and free from unintentional injury or damage. And we don't pretend that we do. And yet, while that is unsettling, it helps keep us strong so that we keep looking for the next good idea. And that concludes my comments, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Humphrey. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kalman. Got a quick question here, uh, quick Council Member Cummings. Thank Members. you. Which month is Rail Safety Month? September. Thank you. That was quick. Go ahead, John. Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, you know, training is the foundation of our operation. When new train operators are hired, they go through 10 weeks of intensive training, which include things like rail uh, rules training, safety keys training, equipment training in both the Siemens and Bombardier cars, uh, yard operations, and finally out on the main line where they learn both the blue and the green line with an instructor so they, you know, see all aspects of the railroad. Uh, after operators have completed their initial training and are certified to operate, our instructors go out with them in 15, 30, and 90 day marks just to make sure the operators understand, you know, what they've gotten themselves into. First of all, they understand the rules, they understand the physical characteristics, and the, they're there, you know, the instructors are there to coach, guide, and mentor them at that point. Um, daily, op daily operators check into the rail control center. You know, they, they uh, actually have a face to face conversation with the rail control center staff to go over any issues that are out in the alignment, events that may be taking place, or work activities. They also review safety tips for the day, for example, encouraging operators to make sure they're using horn and bell appropriately around, you know, passenger, not passengers, but um, people on the uh, sidewalks and, you know, bicycles in the area. To ensure rail operators understand and are following the rules, uh, train operators are tested throughout the year. It's called the, uh, the Rules Compliance Testing Program. Each supervisor tests the, each, uh, the operators about 120 times a month. And last year in 2019, uh, we performed right around 48,000 tests. And our operators do a fantastic job in that compliance. They're just top shelf. In addition to a robust training program, we have a variety of engineering improvements have been completed and are scheduled in the near future. These engineering improvements are developed based on our operating experience, industry best practices, recommendation from our employees, and peer reviews. Um, I got a few videos here that I got to catch up here. Sorry about that. Um, that I can show you that this is the first one. This is an example of a, a program that we started about six years ago to add the wigwag feature on the front of the train. So when you see a train activate its horn and bell, you'll see the front headlights, very similar to a locomotive, start flashing back and forth. Uh, it's very successful. I mean, it, uh, as you can see, adds up, you know, really draws your awareness to it, especially as trains are coming into the platform or approaching uh, crossings. In addition to this, if you'll see on the right-hand side as the train's coming in, you'll see those two side strokes on the side of the train. Now that's a new feature that we're installing. We have five trains currently that have those, uh, those strokes installed and we are adding them to the rest of the fleet. The Siemens fleet will be completed here in 2020, and we're hoping the Bombardier fleet will be completed in the middle of 2021. Uh, you know, our, and this is a shout out to the mechanics, you know, our electronic techs, they do a lot of this work and design. They, you know, they kind of dive head first and they take a lot of pride into designing that feature to make sure it functions correctly, and then they install it throughout the fleet. Um, Next video is a ground mounted pet crossing. These were installed on Green Line early on. And when a train was in the area, it would just turn on. And to add uh, more awareness for our customers, we added a feature to start flashing it uh, in addition to the bells in the area about once a second. It just adds a, you know, good visibility for you know, people that are approaching the uh, pedestrian crossings, especially along University Avenue. Uh, I'm not going to play that one again. Um, this last one, I'm actually really proud of this one. This is a, a combined effort with the Blue Line, um, the Blue Line Extension uh, Project. 
they brought to us several designs that they were planning and installing on the project. And this one really caught our eye of a, a great feature. We use those these blank out signs along University Avenue. And you've probably seen them driving up and down the big blank out sign that you can see the train and it starts flashing in several locations. Well, we designed a smaller uh, blank out sign and installed this at some of our high, let me get in there, um, our high pedestrian crossing areas to draw that awareness to our customers as they're, they're approaching the uh, pedestrian crossing. So not only is it saying walk, don't walk, but it's showing, hey, there's a train in the area as you're approaching this. Um, really like that. And that was um, uh, kind of shout out also to Dan Suggs, who was just previously here. That's his group that goes out there and installs all these. And they've just, you know, over and above all the other work that they have, they take it upon themselves, to, you know, to improve these crossings. Um, this next one is just a, um, uh, a uh, in the top left, I should say, it's what are green line mid block crossings, you know, how they're designed. The first is the continental cross uh, crossing painting. Um, this is back to Mr. Conlon. He pointed out that it appears to be like the Beatles Abbey Road. Now, that's well before my time. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what he's talking about, but I'll have to look it up at some point in the future. Uh, so you have the continental crossings. You get the pedestrian crossings marked on both sides of the university. You get a refuge area where pedestrians can safely wait for both auto and train traffic. Um, the above right picture shows a fence extension. And that's to ensure pedestrians are channeled into the crosswalk and so they're not shortcutting it across the ballasted area. Uh, rail op, uh, the, I should say the lower two pictures are, it's kind of a before and after. You got the left-hand side is the before and the after. This is at 46th Street Station. And this was a, co a combined effort between rail operations, safety, and the engineering and facilities department. Uh, it was a review of opportunities to improve that channeling. Uh, the purpose of this railing is to ensure that pedestrians face the southbound track for a train before crossing the tracks to the northbound platform. So you want to get them so they're turning into it to face the direction of travel so you can see that train coming or else people just walk right off. Um, this is a, well, I like all these projects, I apologize. Um, this is a project that will take place in 2021. On the top left, you'll see there, uh, these are, uh, door locator tiles for the visually impaired, so they know where that front door is uh, when they're entering a platform area, and so they can line themselves up and wait in the appropriate location. And then the bottom right, those are intercar barriers, and um, you know they're designed to prevent people from just inadvertently walking in between the cars, which has that little bit of a gap. Uh, if you went out to front, uh, Raymond Station, you'll see these at Raymond Station currently. And we have a few systems issues that we're still working through right now, but that's a 2021 project. Hopefully we get it completed that year. Um, last slide here. And that is, you know, these are just a few of the examples of the modifications to the light rail system that have either been completed or planned in the near future. We're also continuing to investigate other safety improvements, such as a positive train control for LRT as the industry technology advances. It's something we're you know, excited about, but this is bleeding edge currently for light rail operations. Uh, we're also working very close with the pro project offices. As you can see with the you know, pedestrian blank out signs, we work with them to see what they have available and maybe improve our current system, but we make sure these modifications and improvements are you know, brought to their attention so they're designed into the future projects. Uh, and finally, uh, we are continually striving to improve the safety and quality of the service we provide. As soon as any incident occurs, we as an organization begin analyzing our processes and start taking action right away to improve the team and systems performance and to provide better, safer system. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, though, that frankly, I believe we have the finest bus or, uh, rail operators and mechanics uh, and instructors that teach everyone how to you know, be safe around the train you know, in the, in the country. And these are some fantastic folks and they do a fantastic job. And that concludes my presentation, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Chemos. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Conlon and um, Mr. Humphrey. Humphrey. Um, so you, you mentioned the positive train control yes. plans. I'm wondering what that consists of because I know that, uh, you know, there's a, 
a lot of focus on safety on the trains and um, reducing incidents on the trains. And one of the things that I had suggested a while back was um, if you have uh, fewer ridership during the early morning wee hours, it, is it possible to uh, condense the area that people can come in to the trains or have you know some of the doors shut? I don't I don't know. Maybe that's a design for the future or something like that. But what are your ideas about positive train control? Well, again, this is a, a you know, the industry right now is, it's kind of bleeding edge. There's only one um, property currently that has a design that is not just for rail signals. And there's a difference in what positive material, uh, train, positive train control is capable of. You have rail, uh, you know, rail signals, speed, and also the bar signals. There's no property right now that has a, uh, a positive train control system in place that, uh, that actually uh, manages the bar signal aspect of that. Boston is one of the properties that may have something, and we're investigating that as we speak. Okay, so just to clarify, um, the area of focus for this presentation is just for everything around the outside of the train. Um, yes. Okay. All right. That's where I kind of got off track, so I'm, I'm admitting that. <laughs> I apologize. That's okay. Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you both for the presentation. It's really, um, really interesting. Um, I rode uh, in the cab, the blue line, a couple of weeks ago, and I understand that the invitation extends to anybody who would have that opportunity. It is so valuable in seeing what our operators see and experience and the challenges and things the slides are interesting and very informative and the videos and so forth but i would really urge you to take advantage of that opportunity it's um very very valuable and and you can get many of your questions answered about what their experience is as well i found it really really helpful so i appreciated that thank you and we encourage everybody to do that as they're able to Councilmember Cummings is reading my mind if she sees the note on my paper of encouraging everybody to go out. Um, Mr. Humphrey is the person you want to get in touch with and you will learn so much going out mm -hmm. to, to the operations and maintenance facilities, riding in the train. You also get to see, get informed about the training, get informed about how we manage and the, um, uh, perform the maintenance operations. You learn so much in such a short time. I highly recommend mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it puts everything into... Uh, uh, Thanks, Chair. Fredson. Thanks for your work to keep folks safe. Um, I'm interested to know how we do we classify people who are either killed or injured in terms of transit. <coughs> and um, I'm just interested to know if it's like if they're in a hurry to go to work or if it's uh, just a tendency like they look one way but don't look the other. <laughs> if we kind of break it, break uh, accidents and injuries down to that level. Madam Chair, Council Member, to some extent, yes. Um, we don't necessarily classify them because we don't always know what exactly. But you remind me of a, a phenomenon we call second train syndrome, where, and, and that's used industry wide, where they're looking one way or they think that the signals are there for the one train that they see and they fail to look the other way. Um, and then there's here comes the second train and you know with a mishap consequence often um, but we don't necessarily categorize each one of those we categorize them as you know pedestrian motorist you know a primary cause and contributing factors right um, general manager Koistra Madam Chair, I was just going to suggest he's kind of doing it now but Mike speak a little bit about when an accident does occur, what kind of review we do of those accidents and how we document that. I think maybe while we don't have a structure for classifying uh, cause, and, and, I, and I've seen film as well, where you don't have no idea what was going on. Uh, you can't explain the behavior, that, and there, there's something that probably explains the behavior, but you can't by viewing it. But we have a pretty robust bus structure of, of Looking, looking at accidents and doing a review. If Mike, you, you could expound on that just a little bit. Madam Chair, um, Council Members, there, there's a little difference between commuter rail and light rail. Commuter rail is 
overseen or regulated by Federal Railroad Administration. They require that the dispatching railroad make the notification and in the investigation. So that would be, in this case, Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Despite that, our MTPD is out there investigating as well, okay, to make sure that to the extent that they can, what happened, okay? And um, and then there, there are questions of risk and liability and, and things that come into play as well. In my department, we're concerned with primary cause and contributing factors. Again, commuter rail, they, they, they report that differently. Going to light rail, um, again, Metro Transit PD, because they are qualified in accident reconstruction, they investigate the scene and generate the plat of the accident scene. The safety department, my staff, assesses for how our operators and our equipment worked. And, and we get to using the Metro Transit PD uh, reports when they're available. Sometimes we go on initial report and provide our report internally to the general manager and also to the Office of State Safety Oversight, which is the regulator for LRT, with our findings of primary cause contributing factors. Um, I don't know if that helps. Every We investigate every mishap, every collision on light rail. I just add one thing, Madam Chair, yes. Council members. You know, the second train is a perfect example of a lesson learned. You know, early on in the 2004 or five time frame, we were starting to see this phenomena that people would see a train run behind the train at quick passes and the train was coming in the opposite direction. And we've modified our rules and our training to specifically, you know, uh, teach operators how to react, you know, using the horn as they're approaching the back end of another train slowing down in those areas so you know we do learn from those you know those mishaps and from those experiences and again that's right i go back to my you know instruction department they do a fantastic job you know teaching good habits for our operators based on those lessons learned councilmember cummings thank you madam chair so what have we seen say over the last five years as far as incident incidents go uh up down staying about the same I brought something along. I hesitate to. S Our um, accident rate. I just have something where I had put together a three year average of 16 through 18 collisions and fatalities, three different groups. I compared us against the LRT industry overall. Those are much bigger light rail pro properties and some much smaller, okay? And then the average of the peers, and I took the initiative and, and was not arbitrary, but I picked the properties that would be, that I thought were like us with similar sized metro areas, weather, maybe similar sized, um, light rail operations within that similar size metro area and like Buffalo and Denver, Cleveland, um, three that come to mind, maybe Pittsburgh is in there. Uh, at any rate, I can tell you, Madam Chair, Council Member Cummings, that uh, Metro Transit compares right with our peers uh, in terms of collisions even with our green line that has a lot of low impact, I would characterize, low impact turn, left turn accidents. There are a great many there. Um, and with the LRT industry, both transit and the average of our peers, uh, our rates aren't as good as the LRT in industry overall. I can't explain that at this red hot moment, why? I can also say that with respect to fatalities, Metro Transit LRT is way down below the LRT industry as a whole. 
and the average of our peers. So we're doing okay. How would I characterize that? We're doing okay. We could do better. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. But irrespective of our peers, how are we doing just from your data? Against ourselves? Mm -hmm. About the same over the last three years in terms of numbers of mishaps. This is a general characterization and fatalities. Perhaps you could send out some sort of a, just a quick email summary to the committee with the numbers. I think that would be helpful over the last three years, so you can see, just so there's some perspective. Can do that. All right, uh, Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Thanks. Um, I, I was. I think it just is really helpful when we have conversations about safety to also have the information that allows us to have an understanding from place of strength, so that understanding of crash uh, analysis. And I think it's good to understand also the, the location and, when possible, the demographics of those involved. <coughs> I know from my time working in bike ped work, um, younger people, people of color were way, just like we have disparities and everything else, um, but we're way more represented as the victims in, in crashes. And so I think it's important for us to be able to know and understand that. The question um, um, that I had is how are culturally responsive techniques used or incorporated into the work around safety, education, and engagement in the materials that you developed. I had some observations just looking at some of the materials in there in my experience in, in, in managing an interpretation and translation department when we use colloquialisms that are very um, specific. Or um, I was thinking, looking at slide, um, I think it's slide five, and there's the, the, um, billboard and it says, you know, don't tempt fate. You know, like that saying, don't tempt fate, means something to me being from here. But when you translate that into other languages, does it mean the same thing? Oftentimes they don't, or it doesn't have the same relevance. So I'm just curious, that's an example of um, uh, applying a culturally responsive lens or technique to this kind of work. So I'm curious, how do you do that in the work that you do? Madam Chair, Council Member, we the marketing department helps me with my bright ideas and to make it correct and more glamorous. And so that's where they have contacts with, for example, with these brochures. So Somali, Hmong, and Spanish to make sure that the language that is, it isn't just someone plugs in to word and says, translate this into Spanish, but rather has someone who, who has that language, first language, read it and, and make sure that they get what the, what the intended message was. Um, I don't know that we, we have not, <laughs> we have not spent the, the money on uh, a, a, spe a specific billboard that's other than English and, um, we have it in the brochures and we have it in some of the how to ride. And I think we have translators in the how to ride presentations. And that's as, uh, as much as I know about it as it relates to the, to the safety outreach. If I could, I, I think, so interpretation and translation, translation in this example is one um, method but an example is both Somali and Hmong um, are oral languages, and their populations uh, follow an oral tradition for communication. Um, and so what that means is we had to invent essentially a written language because our culture does not use an oral tradition to communicate. And so a culturally responsive technique for me would be um, using community-based radio because those cultures are oral tradition cultures. African-American tradition is also an oral language tradition as well. Um, American Indian is as well. So those would be some techniques that I would think about um, where um, written language is not as effective as a communications tool. Um, there could be other ways. I'm recognizing the intersections where this billboard is, and I believe it's Lexington. I can't believe I know this. 
because I am such a Minnesota Minneapolis girl. <laughs> but I think it's Lexington and University. Am I right, Chris? I you're well. That's intersection. Yeah, that intersection. I think, and that is such a a, a community of so many different. Asian and African communities across both of the diasporas with tons of folks um, speaking lots of different um, languages and dialects, even in Spanish. Um, having a interpretation in Spanish that's appropriate for our Spanish population is near impossible. Um, it is so challenging. And that is another value of where oral language sharing of information is so impactful and helpful um, because the dialects for Spanish are so varied significantly. Um, and the way that you just get a message across effectively is very different based on the different dialects that people are in. So um, anyways, those were some of the things that I was wondering about and I think, um, it can come out in the built environment as well. I remember the first actuated signal we had in Minneapolis was designed at Cedar um, um, Cedar Riverside. Mm -hmm. And it was because in the community, people were walking and didn't understand the signaling because there were new immigrants, right? So they were so excited to put in this, this auditory stop, wait, 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 but the population was nearly all Somali speaking. <laughs> and so that's a place where when we're not really thinking about it, it was great to have something there, but it wasn't speaking in the language of the people who were there that they were trying to impact. So just thinking about that um, as it relates to our innovation and using great practices and the built environment solutions. I love that so many of these were visual. So I think that leans in a positive direction in that, but it, I think it'd be great to think about some other um, techniques that are really culturally responsive to the growing populations and young people too, um, who may not read as much as they're going about and talking about high school and under, um, but are definitely taking our mass transit. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Chambliss. Okay, just briefly, um, when I'm listening to um, what Linnea is saying, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner, Council Member Linnea is saying, I <laughs> thought to my college um, class, sociolinguistics. So to me, it seems more like social, cultural, linguistics. If we had someone on staff familiar with that, I think that would be helpful. Okay, uh, Council Member Hudson. Thank you, Chair. And just to follow up on the earlier conversation, I think it would be useful to have um, location information for accidents. Um, also, just because uh, if the, I'm assuming there are some intersections where there are more accidents than others, and um, uh, if you want to speak to, you know, I don't know what we do to communicate that to the various cities or district councils, say, along the lines, just to raise awareness and potential action. I wouldn't be shocked if a city were to learn, look, you keep on letting left turns here and you're going to continue to have these accidents if they wouldn't consider actually starting to disallow left turns. Madam Chair, Council Member, we record the longitude and latitude of every mishap that we have on LRT. And some of the, in fact, probably most, if not all of the, um, the improvements, the enhancements that Mr. Humphrey covered today had to do with the, the trending of our accidents, the type and of course the train goes everywhere, so that wasn't necessarily as location-based as, as some, but certainly the uh, blank out sign that lights up and, and the state change to the flashing at, at Snelling, which is, um, yeah, there, more than a few have occurred at Snelling. Let us just say that. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that helps, but we, we, we do, track that and that's part of our trending and we have to answer to the office of state safety oversight as to what are we doing if anything on trending and how are we trying to make it better all right any other comments I would, oh sorry. Add one comment. go ahead Jeff. madam chair council member uh, we do meet with the city of minneapolis city of st paul bloomington you know to 
coordinate on signaling, signal timing, and issues as they arise. So that is definitely something we talk about on a monthly basis with them. If we're seeing trends that would develop, that we need to address with them. Thank you. All right. Anything else from council members? All right. I just had one comment. Um, at our last meeting, I know some of you weren't there, but we had a, a representative from the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee who will be joining us once a month, similar to our tab liaison. Um, we had the slide up there where there were the examples of some changes in stations for um, uh, uh, trying to set things up better from a safety perspective, especially for the visually impaired community. That's how we worked with that, that group, and they had a lot of comments and um, input into that design and so we're going to start getting some of those reports too um, over the next little while so uh, that'll be good all right anything else council member just on that note that's another group that i think is really in that context of cultural responsiveness really think about how do we communicate with them when we're making improvements mm -hmm. um the bumpy texture was applied in in minneapolis during my time on the bike walk effort there and we got a call from our equivalent in, in, mm -hmm. um saying what is this stuff at every intersection? And so sometimes we put things into design as best practice, but we don't communicate out. Um, and we assume everybody's reading at that time, it's the mud, but whatever manual it is <laughs> um, and rules that are out there federally and they don't know. So that's another group that I think is a great example of reaching out to orally and having um, that kind of communication, just not taking for granted that they know what that is. And, I real and we learned that it disrupts the use of a cane. Right and and made like what it, it was against how canes worked. Hopefully now that's something that's integrated. But I don't know that that's the case. And 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 so that's a good thing to think about too. Is how do we let that population also know okay. when we're making improvements with the hope that they're helpful, but <laughs> may cause confusion. Thank you. Good. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Appreciate it. All right. With that, we are done for the evening. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved.